Hello, hello, Terence Parr here. Hey, uh, just continuing with this little video on the plugin for IntelliJ for Antler 4. Uh, you can see here I have a very simplified version of C, and I'm going to use it to describe for you how the input pane works and the profiler and parse tree and things like that. Uh, notice that I've got a comment uh, that comes in on the hidden channel, and I've got white space that uh, is just thrown out and is not sent to the parser. Uh, let's look at the preview window here. All right, I'm going to move this over here a little bit. Okay, so I've got uh, some input. It automatically assumes that I'm going to start from the first rule, but if I want, I can tell it to start parsing. For example, from here, I get a test rule block. Uh, I'll start just with the default of program. So that means I'm looking for a full program. That could be anything like int i, and it will let me type a little bit of input, and then after a while, if I don't type something, it will show me a parse tree here on the right as I go. So. Uh, let's see, what else do I have here? I have a, I can do something like that if I want. Okay. There's a number, another view of it, which is uh, the hierarchy. And I'll show you more about this in a second, but basically uh, when you click on this stuff, it highlights the various elements on the left. Okay, so one of the most important things dealing with input here is knowing what the various tokens are. So for example, uh, I want to know, hey, how did this little I get tokenized? So I've got the control key down and I'm moving the cursor around and you can see that it's over skipped for white space and that tells me that's an integer and tells me this is a comment and notice it's on a particular hidden channel uh, and that's a type and so on. And when you click, it takes you where in the grammar, uh, you can see it jumping around up here, right? If I click on this ID, it takes me up here up here and shows me where in the grammar that got matched, okay? And this this uh, is important when you have a fairly complex grammar. Let's get a little more input. So I'll just type a, a little simple function here. You can see I've got the parse tree. Um, you can export to various uh, image formats there if you like. Uh, at this particular point, um, you often want to see the hierarchy view. So if you click here, it will take you down into this hierarchy and show you where in particular something was matched. So here's a block. And uh, so this goes back and forth. You can you can click here and it keeps those two synchronized. So that's often a lot more useful than seeing a very large parse tree because sometimes the parse tree looks like this and everything is filled in, it's so big. Let's move on to the profiler tab now. Let's get a little more room over here. So the first thing you notice is I've got some stats over here, how many characters and lines and how many tokens were in the input how long it took in milliseconds, and how much of that time was spent in the prediction function that is deciding between the various alternatives, like in a definition, the difference between a function definition and a variable definition, you know, there's a certain amount of prediction that has to happen on the left edge for me to determine which path to take in that particular parser rule. The DFA cache miss tells me that there's a whole bunch of decisions going on, and 21 out of 23 required that I actually do the analysis. But two out of the 23, I actually knew what to do and was able to reuse previous analysis. And of course, the more input I have, uh, the larger that um, cache, rate, uh, cache hit is gonna be. The look ahead burden is really saying, okay, if, there, if there's 18 tokens, if it were 18 out of 18, that essentially just means that for every input token, I have one look ahead operation I have to do. In this particular case, I have 1.28 I have to do. That gives me some indication of the complexity. Okay, so this first column here, this gives you information. Each row is a particular decision. So if I click on one, you can see it highlights in the grammar here. It also highlights where in the input that is. So if I click on a different decision, you can see that it's going to various bits of the input. Uh, you can sort, of course, by these things. Uh, what I tend to do is look for the maximum look ahead that's required. So this tells me how many milliseconds was in there, how many times the rule was called or the decision was invoked. The maximum amount of look ahead that was consumed by all possible decisions, or I'm sorry, every invocation of that decision. We'll look at ambiguities a little bit. And this is how many times a decision was made and the cache missed. The key here is this maximum look ahead. In other words, how far ahead at the current point of the parse do I have to look to distinguish between current alternatives? So actually, let's look at this second one here. So it said it had to look three tokens to distinguish this void F left parenthesis. So that deepest look ahead is three. So to distinguish between the function def and variable definition, it had to look at three tokens. 
And that makes sense because I don't know it's a function until I see the left parenthesis. Notice that I can uh, right click because that's that little underlying thing there. And I can look at the interpretations. I'm going to move this window here. You can see here that I'm showing the two possible interpretations of the input void f followed by the left parenthesis. Now we know that it's a function definition and so that it's going to you know, start matching the real thing. But on the second alternative, I could have matched this vardef thing and stopped at the semicolon. Uh, or actually, I should say it stops because it doesn't see a parenthesis in the input stream. And so that's why you see this thing fail. So this may or may not be useful to you. It's uh, primarily interesting to know just how much look ahead is required to distinguish between these alternatives. So there's another one that's even longer, and that one is to decide here between declaration and def. So a function declaration would be just a semicolon right here, but the fact that we see the start of a function body indicates that it should be uh, a function def. So if you look at the look ahead interpretations for this one, it tried to match it as a decal, but it sees the left curly and realizes, oh, it's going to be an actual def. And so that's why this function def actually does the matching. The next thing to worry about when you're dealing with a grammar and trying to debug it is to find ambiguities. And sometimes you can't get away with out the ambiguity, but often you should work to get rid of these things because it tends to increase the amount of analysis that Antler has to do. And generally, you don't want more than one interpretation of the same input. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add like a C++ function style typecast. OK, so here I have an arbitrary function call. And here is a C++ style function typecast. So for example, this input here is now ambiguous because, oh, got some reason I'm going to start. OK, I'm going to choose this as the start rule. Uh, you can see that I've got an ambiguity down here. I can just bring this to the top. So that's ambiguous in this particular decision because this can either be an arbitrary function call or it can be this new alternative I added, which looks like a typecast or a single argument function call. And so I can right click on this. And now when I show the interpretations, it's showing me the difference in these ambiguities or the interpretations and second alternative of EXPR, one, two, versus three, one, two, three. It's this one here. And they're both valid matches. And by default, Antler picks the first one, so it'll choose this one. So you, you kind of want to get rid of this, but look, it tried to look further ahead to resolve the ambiguity. So it looked four tokens and realized, you know what? Nope, they both end up at the same spot at this semicolon right here. So nothing I can do about it. Um, I either have to get rid of that or I just accept the fact, in this case, that it's never going to match. So th that's why we know it's OK, because no matter what, this is going to match here. This is a situation where you probably want the semantic phase of the processor, whether it's a compiler or interpreter, to say, using the symbol table, what that is. So if ID ends up being a type, then you would want to choose this one. Now I could put a semantic predicate in here, but that means I need to do symbol table construction as I'm doing the parse. That might not be your choice. These days, I like to keep a clean grammar like this so that I can retarget the grammar to use in other situations. OK, so often this will get fairly full because there's a lot going on in the grammar. And so I often just do this you know, sorting to find the most troublesome looking things and jump around to the various decisions to see what I can do about it. And this can make a massive difference in performance. The amount of look ahead, you know, if you can get this down to one or two tokens, uh, generally that's going to go faster. And the fewer ambiguities you have, generally it's going to be faster as well. Okay, well, I hope that's helpful. See you later.